Okay. Okay, yay. Okay, welcome everybody. Hopefully some of you haven't read the whole paper in detail, otherwise it might not be, uh, have much to say. I encourage questions, otherwise I'll just rattle away and um, finish early, which you might want me to do, and get, get to the pub earlier. So if you have any questions, just stick your hand up or shout at me or say something. So I uh, encourage um, questions. So just some background. So I'm working on a book on uh, evidence-based software engineering. So I go around collecting data and asking people, have you got your data? And I shall be asking you later. And I was at a workshop just over a year ago, bumped into this guy, got started chatting, and he appeared to have all this data. Ooh. Um, so that's a previous book. Oh, let's stick to the slides. Uh, previous book on C with lots of data. If you want to download an awful lot more data, in particular the data for the book, you can go there. You can download a draft PDF um, at that website. And of course, you're all going to become readers of my blog, Shape of Code. Well, typically, uh, when I get small data sets, I usually discuss them on the blog. But this data set was so big and so wonderful, I, uh, there's a paper. So the start of the story is, is chatting to Stephen Cullum. Those of you who, who worked in software know that data, real data is hard to get hold of. I was at a workshop about a year ago, just over a year ago, at uh, University College. Started chatting with this guy who's doing a PhD. Just started a PhD, and uh, he said he worked in a company, he had all this data. Oh, can I have it? He checked with his uh, fellow ex directors, and they said, Yes, you can make it public. Fantastic. So, the, the, his company, Software and Partnership, was started in 2002, and their data runs from 2004 to 2014. Then they sold the company, and they've gone off doing other things. So, my interest is uh, evidence based software engineering. So, Rather than just producing papers and saying, oh, isn't this wonderful, and going to conferences and what have you, and what I call mathematical orgasms, I say this stuff has to be useful. So if you have this data and you come up with these theories, people have to say, yes, this is useful, I can use this to do so-and-so. So one of the questions I kept saying to Stephen was, well, what would be useful? We found this stuff, I found these patterns in the code, how would you use it? Or is it just me, I found these patterns and I think they're interesting, and actually they're, they're not interesting at all. Well, how would you how would you use these patterns? Uh, what practical use? Because it's very easy when you've got a data set of this size. Uh, it's very interesting, very easy to find stuff, but you want to find the useful stuff. So so that's the start of the story. So I'm going to say something about uh, the existing practice in effort estimation. Uh, talk something about the patterns I found in the data, and then say, well, what next? So. Effort estimation, you, you really, one thing that's been ignored is the incentives. Uh, if you're bidding for work, you have to win the contract. So if, I'm, if Renzo comes to me and asks me to do some work, and I think, well, he's also chatting to that guy over there. Perhaps he's going to get that guy to do some work, and I better undercut him because I want the work. So I better ch uh, uh, you know, bid less than him and him over there. So the natural tendency is to, is to bid low. And I'm sure I can make it up later. Oh, Renzo, you didn't say about that. You know, it's going to cost more now. So the natural set tendency when you're bidding on external work is to underbid. So you bid low, get the work later. And, of course, that's quite common. This is a quote from a, a prof at uh, Oxford who does research on, on effort estimation. And he says, yeah, they deliberate, everybody knows that you deliberately underestimate. And you go to the, I mean, Renzo, Renzo might come to me and say, well, Derek, you know, actually, we don't have that much money. Could you actually bid low? And we'll find the money later. So we might be, you know, I'm being nice to me. He's being nice to me. You know, we're going to bid low, and then you get some more money later, we'll bid high. It's in kind of everybody's interest, apart from the people who are paying the money, of course, to, to, to start low and then get more money later. So you, you, you wonder, why is everybody shocked when uh, things turn out to be much more expensive than the, they originally bid? Well, of course they are. I mean, what, you know, what planet are you on, really? And then if you look at internal uh, company um, projects, let's say Renzo's my manager and he come and comes and asks me, how long do I think this is going to take? Well, what's my incentive? Why would I underbid? I mean, if, if I don't get that piece of work, he's paying me the money anyway, isn't he? So I might just as well bid high. Then when I come in under budget, I'm, he's going to be really impressed and I'll get, I'll get a big raise. So on internal projects, the incentive is actually to bid high and then come in under budget and look really good. Now, most of the public data is for, for bidding work. 
people go out and say, well, how much did they bid? How much did it actually cost? So when you go out and you collect data, most of it's this kind of stuff. And of course, all the, everyone says, well, you know, uh, uh, underbidding, it, it, that's the rule. No, it isn't the rule. If you get internal company stuff, a lot of that is overbid. So that's the background on uh, a lot of uh, effort estimation research. But people are shocked that, that companies uh, underbid on contracts. Now, how can this possibly be? We have to improve things. Well, no, it's just human nature. It's all about human, and then, of course, a lot of these models don't. Um, oh, I'm jumping ahead of my stuff. How so? So yes, yeah, so, so the existing public data is um, is bid for work, and there's a few hundred rows. If you if you say, well, I've got a big data set. Traditionally, a big data set is a, is a few hundred um, bids and, and estimates and, and actuals, and typically also the, the the data is the estimate and the actual, and that's it. That's your data. You've got a few hundred estimates and actual, and you've got to analyze that and build models for it. There are a few, uh, a few uh, internal data sets. Uh, Les Hatton's is one. Uh, if you want the reference, go and download the PDF, and you can get the, the reference to Hatton's work. Um, now, when the SIP date, um, Stephen kept saying to me, yeah, yeah, we, we've been doing this for all these years. And when it arrived, it was like, there's 12,000 rows in it. So that's two orders of magnitude bigger than anything else that's publicly available. So immediately, 12,000. And then what information? Well, that's what you typically get, that. that You don't normally get any of that. You get estimate and actual. This gives us a develop. We, they're in there, there were developer ID. It's all anonymous, but you know who was working on the project. You know what tasks they were working on, so you know how many developers were on each task. Uh, and you've got date information as well. So you can say, well, what's happening over time? Um, 10,000 unique tasks. So most of the tasks, were, uh, 85% of the tasks, 85, 84, 85, were, were done by one person, and the rest were teams. Uh, when they sold the company, there were still so, some tasks that were outstanding. So there, there's no data on the completion of those tasks because uh, the directors left. There were 22 developers and 20 projects. So this is, this is just literally a huge, sorry, yeah? Uh, were the tasks developed, uh, the, the distributed evenly around one project, or were some of those very heavy and others? Next slide. <laughs> uh, sort of the next slide. Uh, so... Typically, when I get hold of some new data, I write a blog post on it, or if it's not that big, I'll just stick it in the book. It all depends on how many blog posts I've got lined up. When I saw this data, I thought, this data deserves a paper. There is just so much of it, and there's so much in there. And uh, fortunately, Stephen was up for it. And so the, the structure of the paper is a conversation, because that's what data analysis is really all about. It's a conversation. There's me doing the analysis. Okay, I've run a company, I've run software projects, so I know about estimating and bidding and so on. But really, you, you need a domain expert, and the domain expert on this data was Stephen Cullum. He's, he's director of the company, he did all this stuff. He, he, he's one of the major estimators. Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a paper where you discuss a two-way convers you know, two conversation and write it down as the paper? So the structure of the paper is around a discussion. I discover things, I talk to Stephen, and he says, well, this, that, or the other, and he tells me what's going on. And I would keep saying to him, well, you know, what would you like me to do? Oh, I found this, what do you think? And if, if, when you read a paper, he's very, very honest about what their plans were and what they tried to do, and so on. So, so that's where this all comes from. It's not just a sort of, here's the data, and you've got no background to it. So uh, hopefully you can see those. So this is the uh, by individual developer, and this is how many estimates they made. So a small number of developers made lots of estimates. And some of the developers made not very many. And, and here's the project, different project, the project number. So a few projects had lots of estimates, and some projects had hardly any. That sort of a bit asks your... Uh, of course, my, my, my stock fallback is to say, well, the data's there, go and get it and have a look. <laughs> if I don't know the answer, that's what I'm going to say. So um, that's kind of a snapshot of, of, of the data. The other thing about the paper is when you're talking to someone who, uh, who, who's not immediately interested in what you're doing, you've got to convince them to be interested. 
And so my, the first thing I wanted to do was to find something interesting. So Stephen would say, oh, that's interesting, and want to be more involved with the data analysis, rather than me going off and then writing stuff and then coming back. So I wanted to capture his attention. So the order in which I did things, which is the order they appear in the paper, is not really the order that you would do things when you typically write papers. I did the, 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 the paper was targeted, the work was targeted to attract his attention. I wanted to keep him involved. And the way to keep someone involved is to keep feeding them things that they find interesting. So I kept having to find stuff. Then you say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, good, I found I, I can relax for a bit now. So, so some of the stuff is just sort of like just a general overview of the, of, of the data. So the focus of the, of, the, um, of the analysis was understanding. Everyone's into, well, lots of people are into AI and machine learning and this, that, and the other. And so the, the way to build understanding is to build regression models. I'm going to be talking about, a bit more about regression models and doing handcrafted searches. I'm not interested, I wasn't interested in black box prediction. People these days just throw their data in, into a machine learning, it builds a prediction um, system, and then you make predictions. But it's completely black box, you don't know what's going on. You just throw your, your data in there and it makes predictions. But it doesn't tell you anything. And I, I wanted to, to target understanding, which means I had to think about the data, try different things out, so that it, there's, there's no machine learning in here at all. Um, Machine learning and software engineering, it's just a complete train wreck. People just go out, they throw it into the machine learner, they make predictions, and they get papers published. It's a great way of pu publishing papers. Uh, I just call them uh, clueless button pushers. And then they, they tweak their knobs on the, on the machine learning, and they build a better predictor, and they get another paper published. Like, Ooh. So um, the first regression model is to say, well, what's the relationship between actual and the estimate? And uh, here's the estimate there in hours. Here's the actual there. In Sorry, this is, this is in R. And R's graphing of numbers is terrible. I, I've got to fix. So that's the roughly what, what the data, that's roughly what, in fact, actually what the data looks like. And that's the model I fitted to it. So um, when, you, when you draw it, the 1.1 means the, uh, the, the, the estimate is under. But the, this power here saying it's over. So you have to draw them. Now, that, that, that green line there, that green line shows you where actual equals estimate. Or sorry, estimate equals actual. So if the, if the actual was exactly the same as the estimate, you'd get that green line. In reality, you've got that red line. So what's happening here is that for under about an hour and a half, estimates under an hour and a half are are actually underestimates. They'd have been much more accurate if they'd have said an hour and 15 minutes. An hour and 15 minutes is a much more accurate estimate than an hour. Estimates over about an hour and a half were, un were, uh, were overestimates. Now you might say, well, this, is, this, this model is too simplistic. Well, yes it is, it's very simplistic. I mean, this, this is the actual data. Um, let, let's put some more variables in there. Typically, when you analyze effort data, this is all you can do, because you just have those two variables. But in this data set, we've got loads more variables. So let, let, let's build um, more sophisticated models. And there are lots of projects. There are about 20 or so projects. So the obvious question to ask is to say, well, is this model the same for all projects? How, how does the esti estimation accuracy vary between projects? And so we change our model. We say, well, the actual is this, and uh, we've got a, a project identifier there. So different projects will be a different number, different multiplier. And that black line there, that line is where the estimate and the actual are the same. <coughs> yep? Before we just move to, could you please tell how did you capture actual time? They, me they measured it in hours. They have a system they call Clarity. And when they ran, sorry, I should have said about their Clarity system. They, they, they implemented this system called Clarity. And when you started on a project, the, the, the developer logged into Clarity. And it moved through various phases. And when they finished it, they logged, out, they logged it in Clarity. So they have this system called Clarity that logs the start and the end. And so what Stephen did was he extracted all that information from Clarity. OK. Did you, have, did you try to clean outliers or something? 
I didn't clean anything. There are some outliers in there, uh, which we discovered later on in the project, where there were some uh, one-hour estimates that were taking 100 hours. Uh, what, what's going on? And what happened is uh, a couple of people, a couple of the developers, were not logging, logging that they'd finished. They were carrying on with the same task ID. And so what did actually take an, uh, something like an hour, they, they were reusing it. And so it looked like it took 100 hours, but it didn't. So that was one of the things we, we highlighted, I uh, found out in the analysis. So there are some stuff in there like that, yes. Uh, but most of it, and uh, of course, then you say, well, how accurate when they log out is it? So if it's an hour, were they five minutes over just because they were you know, making a cup of coffee or asking the phone? So there is some noise in the data, yes. And, and we don't know, you know how much noise is there, really. And it's a bit suspicious. There are lots of one hours that finish on one hour. And so that you get the thing like the Parkinson effect, where work expands to fill the time available. So if they finished in 50, 50 minutes, did they sort of hang around for, for 10 minutes and then finish it in an hour? So you think, well, but you don't know. Uh, there's, there's a guy, I think he's in, in, in Belgium, who's trying to do some analysis on if, if a Parkinson effect does exist, what would the effort distribution look like? And he's come up with this effort, uh, Parkinson distribution, and he's saying it should look like so and so. So we're trying to look at the data and say, well, that's because of the Parkinson effect. There are two, if you estimate an hour, and the reality is an hour, and there are too many of them, it's a bit suspicious. You're, you're probably delaying a bit. Um, so he's looking at this data at the moment, trying to, trying to see what's going on. Yeah, so, so, what, if you, so this is breakdown by different projects. So some projects are always, if it's below, uh, it's always, they're always overestimating. So the effect of the project is to move the line around a bit. Some projects are this, yeah? Do you have a justification for using the same power in each project? Um, th that, that number will change between projects. No, no, the 0 0.86. Um, it, it didn't change the model by much. Right. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the, slopes, the slopes are all the same as well. You say, well, the slope ought to be slightly different. Yeah. And the, the model, if, if, you, if you do that, it's slightly different, but right. not... Okay. It, the, the code, if you go and land the, load the data, there's a directory called code. And if you go in the code, the, all the R code's there. And you, can, you can see it's commented out and you can have a go. Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. it's not... I mean, you might say, well, why am I saying 8, 6? Isn't that too many decimal points? Why didn't I say 0.9? Yeah. And the answer is because it moves around a bit. And I wanted to show you the fact it was moving around a bit. And if you've got this amount of data, you can almost get, you can get two decimal points. Okay. Um, right, thanks. Also another information, uh, do you know by project ID how many people are in each project? Yes, yes. So yes. Also, there's an average, are we talking about large groups? Or? The, um, no, they, the, mo most, well, you, uh, most teams were, were one people, one person. Ah, okay. Because look, you've got, you've got uh, th that many tasks. Uh, uh, 20 projects, 20 yeah. That's the ratio one, one, one. Well, if there were if there, there were ten thousand tasks and eight thousand of them were unique, uh, most tasks only have one person on them. Oh yeah, but the task for the project. Ah. Uh, uh, wondering um, if the blue project that was constantly overestimating was because of a single person responsible for. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, what was one? Let, let, let me show you the next slide. That might sort of. So we've got more more data. So let's 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 build a bigger model. Right. This, so this is the last. So we've got actual. We've got estimate. We've got project. We've got the developer ID, and we've got the team size, the number of people working on the team. So this is actually the bit that originally I was really interested in because you think, well, the bigger the team, the size of the team ought to have an impact. And it does, but it's only a 1%. That, that bit there improves the model by 1%. And it's like, oh, really? <laughs> 1%. So, so here we're saying that the type of project makes a difference and the type of people on the team make a difference. Now, what I did with those, I actually highlighted, I said, this person consistently overestimates, this person consistently underestimates. And I told Stephen the developer ID, and he went and looked up who they were. 
And he said, yes, you're right. <laughs> he said, that person is a sort of a salesperson, an outgoing person, and they're always thinking, yeah, we can do it, we can do it. They underestimate, or ten, compared to everybody else. Are more difficult to estimate than others? Well, you probably already knew that anyway. But I put a number to it. Uh, I can tell you which developers probably overestimate or underestimate. You probably already knew that anyway. You knew that so-and-so was, you know, he was very optimistic and outgoing and he always tended to underestimate and the other person was over. This puts some numbers to it. But how do you use that information? Would you run team training exercises? And I, I, I had several round discussions with him, well, because well. you built this model, it looks very pretty, yeah, everyone's going, oh yeah, that looks impressive. But how, how is it actually useful? What, what would you do with this? The team size effect, well, it exists, but it's only 1%. Well, who cares, 1%. Um, so, there was a lot of head scratching around this. You know, how, how would you use this? Would, would, would you just leave things alone? Say, well, yeah, but he's, you know, he's an outgoing guy. He, he always underestimates. We know it. We, can, you know, we adjust for that. So what? So, I... Apart from the fact it's a nice equation, you think, well, is it actually useful? Okay, we can solve it, right? Sorry? You can solve it, you can fill all the values, and then you know the actual time. Right? <laughs> but, but, but then would, would, that, would, would, would that feed back in? Would, would you, well, I'll come, I'll come back to that later. Yes, you, you, you could, yes, you could say that. And then make an adjustment for it. Uh, but then would people start adjusting for your adjustment? And you think, well, well. So... So that's as far as that got. I looked for some other things as well, and they weren't there. So that's a bit disappointing, but there you go. Um, so what other patterns were, were there in the data? And uh, I'm talking about round numbers and time dependencies. We've got data over time. The original data set didn't include dates. Now I was chatting with Stephen, and I think I managed to impress him enough. He went off and, and invested some time and extracted dates from, from the uh, database. So then we had dates as well as uh, projects. So we could do some time dependency analysis. Round numbers, when, when, when people communicate, if I ask Renzo the time, he's probably not going to say, you know, it's 7.23 and 30 seconds. He might say, well, it's 7.20 uh, or 7.25. He'll, he'll round. Uh, question, how precise was the downtime measurement? Like, was it just hours or minutes? Or it was minutes. Okay. Well, it was actually, put, yeah, because it was fractions of an hour, yes, yeah. Because there are 20 minute, 15 minute times in there. Um, so people use round numbers, they communicate in round numbers. So they're usually divisible by two or five, powers of ten. There's all sorts of research on round numbers. So, um, and there's some time dependencies. Now, this is the graph that really, really, you can't, can you see that, that blue magenta there? This is the, <laughs> the red's the interesting one. This is the one that really got me. The red, so, how many one-hour estimates were there? How many two-hour estimates? How many five-hour estimates? This is a logarithmic scale. So, the red are estimates. And if you look, look how many times people have estimated one hour. Two hours, five hours. When I saw that seven, I thought, you've got seven, you work a seven-hour day. People are estimating seven, uh, one hour a day, and it's seven hours. Yes. There's 21, there's 14. Um, there's a hundred. Look, the, 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 there's a few eights and there are no nines. People have not estimated nine hours. Why not? Nine is not a round number. So, um, why 14? There's 15 there. There's a few 15s. But look, what, what, what happened to 12, yeah, 11, 12, 13? 14 because it's two, uh, two days and then there's a small 15. People are estimating on round numbers. Now that graph, that just blew me away. I thought, oh yes, I'd always known about round numbers, but I'd never appreciated how important they were for estimating the people are using round numbers. So the question I asked Stephen, I said, well, look, that one hour, you could improve your accuracy by saying one hour, 15 minutes, and your estimates will get a lot more accurate. But then what if the client thinks in round numbers? If I go up to Renzo and say, yeah, it's going to take an hour, he thinks, yeah, hour, half an hour, yeah, hour and a half. If I got to him and say it's going to take an hour and 15 minutes, I'm giving the impression it's going to be a lot more, that I'm, I'm a lot more accurate than I really am. So actually, although one hour is not 
technically a better estimate. It's a better perception of what my estimate is. And his opinion of me, oh, it's going to be an hour, he'll think, yeah, 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 yeah. If I say an hour and 15 minutes, he probably thinks well, it's an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes. I, 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 I box myself in. And Stephen came to the conclusion, actually, a, a, an hour was a good estimate. He wouldn't change that hour to an hour and 15 minutes just to improve the accuracy of the estimate. Clients were happy with an hour, with two hours. They're happy with a day. So we've got an intrinsic source of inaccuracy here of what the client expectation is. The client expects a round number. You give him a round number. And all these blue lines here, these magenta, those are the actuals. So there's the, there's the one hour. There were like 13 hour, one hour estimates. And that magenta line finishes there. So half of the one hour estimates were not done in one hour. And there's 10, there's, there's, uh, 10 hours there. But look how many estimates are, are, are in there with the small numbers. Sorry about the colouring there. Look, this, 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 this um, three quarters of an hour, there's only a few numbers of them that are uh, three quarters of an hour. But look how many actuals were three quarters of an hour. So for me, this was the big like, woo, round numbers. People are estimating in round numbers. Which is an intrinsic source of inaccuracy. Because things don't, the, the, the magenta lines all there, there, here. So two and a bit hours, there are no estimates at that. I was thinking that, that's why we estimated in Fibonacci points, uh, not in hours. Because that removes part of that noise. But that still limits the number of values you can use. And so the, the actual is going to be between those. You're rounding. Yes, you're still rounding, yes. So it's an intrinsic source of inaccuracy. You say, well, how accurate can the model... Uh, at least you don't think about like, working days or um, working hours. Well, I, I wondered if people are thinking... In, there's, there's some research that, that says if you think in small numbers, you, 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 you behave differently or your results are different if you think in large numbers. So I, took, I, I analysed the data where people were obviously thinking in days and I compared it when they were thinking in hours and said, were the two models the same? And I was expecting them to be different. So, and they, were, they weren't, they were the same. So I wondered, were people thinking in days and then converting to hours? Or just thinking, well, six hours, or okay, I'll round it up to seven. So did you think, you know, were they thinking in hours and then rounding to, to, to make it up to a day? We got the Parkinson effect again. So this was like, oof, wow. So time dependencies. Um... When people are making uh, a lot of the task estimates are very short, hour, couple of hours. If if you keep making the same estimate, multiple estimates, are you affected by the one you previously made? So if you previously made a one-hour estimate, are you likely to make another one-hour estimate? Uh, is is it going to anchor you? you have, if I if I say Lorenzo ten, then I ask him a number. Uh, he's likely to give a number closer to ten than if I hadn't said ten. I've, 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 I've given his num a mind a number, which has anchored him to 10. So I, I can influence his, his, his answer by, by giving him numbers. So was there a serial correlation in the uh, estimates? I mean, I had look, I was hoping there would be, because I, I like to find things, but there wasn't one. There's no serial correlation. And the other thing was learning. These guys were doing lots of estimates over a 10-year period. They must have learned something. There must be some learning in there. And the product evolved. So, what time dependencies did we find? Uh, okay. Um, next slide. So, this is a bit of a, uh, a side one. So, how many uh, events, by event I mean a, a, they made an estimate, they started a project, or they, they started a task, or they finished a task. That's an event. So, the number of events which is either an estimate, a start, or a finish, a completion per day. Uh, we've got our good old power law going down. So we have uh, most events, most days um, had a single event happening. Uh, some days had, this is events per day. Uh, some days had uh, two events per day, three events per day, four events per day. And we've got our good old power law happening there, events per day. So on most days, one thing happened. They made an estimate, they started something, or they completed something. 
So uh, you say, well, what, what's the point of this, this graph? What does it tell you? Uh, if you if you're going to model uh, an agile development process, this graph would be very interesting because you could you could feed that into your building of a model. Is it is it useful for you otherwise? I don't really think so. If you can think of a use for that graph other than modelling, let me know, please. Um, learning. People improve with practice. The estimates should get better with practice. They don't. Well, why not? Why didn't... And, well, why? why? There are lots of things to learn. Now, my explanation of this is the developer incentive. What's my incentive to make better estimates, more accurate estimates? That's, I'm being asked to do that. Isn't it better for me to get better at what I'm doing? So I can do more in an hour. Do you really care if I tell you that the, the accuracy of my uh, estimates improves? Or would you rather I spent my time getting better and being faster? You'd rather I got better at my job, wouldn't you? And if the accuracy stays the same, well, you know, do you care? Their accuracy is actually quite good. Actually, it's very good. It's consistently good as well. They have good enough accuracy. Why get better? Why not just get better at your job and leave the accuracy the same? So that's my explanation. And this is individual developers. So this is uh, the estimate versus actu actual. And you can say, see that it stays virtually the same. This is the number of estimates. These, this is developer 58, 13, 22. This guy here, obviously... Don't know what happened there, it got worse. But the, the, the accuracy of their estimation stays the same over, over the, the length of the time they're involved. It doesn't change. There's no learning going on. Well, there's no learning of improving estimation. They may be getting better at their job, but we, I've got no data on that. They may be doing more in that one hour, but I, I don't know. That, that's the assumption I'm making. So are they always estimating their own tasks? They estimate their own tasks. Right. And if you're on a team of two, they, they estimate together. So if we're on a team together, we both agree how much, we're gonna, how much this task is going to take. So they estimate their own task, yes. So you might think, well, what, what, things might change over time. So the question is, What's the, different, how, what's the time interval between me making an estimate on a task and me actually starting it? So this is working days and this is tasks. So the, um, the yellow line there, I should have done them all in yellow and red, the yellow line is the, is the time interval between making the estimate and actually starting the task. And most, most estimates, you start them on the same day. You estimate and do it on the same day. And we, our good old-fashioned power law, uh, actually, it, it's quite close to one in both cases. And the other one is, once you've started a task, how long does it take? How many working days does it take? And that's the red line. So most tasks, they start on the day and they finish on the same day. In the previous slide, when I mentioned that the estimation accuracy did not improve with learning, yeah. um, is that uh, the person doing the estimation is that the same person who had worked on the full paper or is that a different person? For example, if a person who is more familiar with the full paper will eventually quickly complete the task. Yes. And uh, a person who is not familiar with that one will take uh, more time. Actually. Yeah. But if the person is the same person who is doing the implementation and uh, doing the estimate as well, uh, I would think that they will do a better, better estimation of accuracy. Yeah, so if, if Renzo and I are working on a project and I know about, uh, on, on the system, and I know about this one really well and he doesn't, the chances are that they're going to ask me, he, he might say, well, Derek, you know, and we're both working on it together, Derek, you know that one better than me, you make the estimate. So although technically we're both working on the team, he might bow to my expertise. Or perhaps I'll just tell him to shut up and you know, boss him around, I don't know. Um, that... I had a look at the, I could, the answer is I couldn't find that effect. I couldn't find an individual influencer. Either someone was very outgoing or they were very cautious. You, you could see that effect in the data. Now, it might be that if you do some fancy statistics I don't know about, which 
quite probable, you'll find that effect in there, that that, that data, that information's there, I just couldn't find it. it. So I'm hoping, you know, so I'm hoping that people who know more about this data analysis than me will come and find some of this stuff. But I, the answer is that I didn't find any. So not that it's not there, I didn't find it. Because <laughs> you're right, that if people know about this better than, than someone else, they ought to give better estimates. And uh, regarding this graph, you, you just said that um, most of the estimates were done and started the same day? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I'm surprised by that, because usually agile processes have a sprint iteration that is not one day, and the well, estimates tend to be done at the beginning of the iteration. But they, they, they have, well, because what would happen is that, that they were working in land, clients would come to them, you know, walk up to them. And say we want this, and they say it's going to take an hour. Okay, do it. Ah, all right. So agile. Yeah, it's that agile. Yeah, they're, they're making one-hour estimates. <laughs> they're, they're really agile. I mean, some of the projects are a hundred hours, but not not too many. Yeah. So people would come up to them, you know, on, on a day, come up to the desk and say, <coughs> off they go. So there were some. I mean, you know, there, there were like ten out to you know, over a week. Sounds more accountable. Yeah. You know what, what they were using? No, I didn't. I didn't. I don't. I, it suddenly struck me this, this uh, last night. I didn't even know what language they were working. I didn't ask. I suspect Java, but I never actually asked what language they were writing in. <laughs> Strange thing not to ask. But there you go. Um, so again, you think, well, what's the use of this data? If you're building a model uh, to simulate um, agile workloads, then this 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 data is useful. But is it useful from a developer or a management point of view that? Okay, it's a power law, blah, 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 really. Um, so this is another one of those graphs that I kind of drew because it was interesting and then thought, well, actually, what use is it? So, <laughs> it's quite a hard, hard problem. If you're building a model, if you're trying to simulate workflows, you need this data. But if you're not trying to simulate workflows, then this is kind of like squiggles on a, on a page. Uh, okay, pro product evolution. Just waited for the next slide to show how it's related to the actual accuracy of the estimates when you estimated way before you actually started the task. Have you measured this thing? Uh, I couldn't understand it. Yes, yeah, so, so for instance, if I estimate and then five days later I start, I didn't look at that. Um, that's certainly, um, so you're thinking if I estimate now and then next week I actually do the work, that would have an impact? So what would change between now and next week? You know more, probably, at the, like five days down the line, the project. You I, know more, you should be more accurate because you have more evidence or whatever. That would be my guess. But well, I, things I can know. change that if you developed in the meantime that would have impacted the initial yes. estimate. That, that's yeah. kind of an approach, that the deferred decisions, right? So yes. more information later. But yeah, just a guess. It's full psychology, right? Yeah, so I... So the, if I had more information later, that would mean I would work faster, and therefore my, my actual would be less than my estimate. But there again, it could go the other way. Something might happen that I didn't know about. So I estimate now, and then I'm always blaming everything on Renzo here. He goes and does something. He goes, oh no, he's, look what he's done, and I estimated you know, two hours, and Renzo's done this, it's going to take me, you know. Yes. So it could cancel out, right? Yes, yes. But deviation may be bigger. I did, the answer is I didn't look. I, I, I didn't look. What happened was I, I was chatting with Steve. We got to the end of December. I thought, okay, right, we're going to, we've got other things to do. We're going to we'll, we'll get the paper out. We're going to do other things. But yeah, that, that's certainly a, a good point. Yes, is, does the accuracy? Um, is, it does the interval between estimating and and, and starting have an impact? Um, go and have a look at the data. You, you, it could still have an impact. Yes. So product evolution, so data starts 2004, finishes 2000, end of 2014. So you'll notice there's a big difference here. So this is kind of like the development phase and this is the maintenance phase. That's quite noticeable, it kind of So these, 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 these are uh, uh, summed over per month. This is the mean value per month. So the completed tasks you know, were, were around to 150, then it just dropped during the maintenance phase. 
you can see that the, the uh, unique developers was here, then it dropped so they had fewer people. And the actual task hours, um, which is in blue, um, kind of went up a bit. You think, well, maintenance, it would go down, wouldn't it? Um, so I, when I saw that, I thought, ah, I'm going to have to build another model. There's going to be a model for before then and a model after then, and the numbers are going to be different. And I went and built the model, and they were more or less exactly the same, which I thought was really odd, because you think, well, if you're in, in development mode, your, your estimate, it must affect your estimates accuracy, but it didn't. The, that, that, that model I built the, the, with the, all, all the parameters and what have you and the exponents was essentially more or less the same for both of those phases, the, the two halves. And I was really surprised by that. I thought there, there must be some, but there wasn't. So a lot of this data analysis, is, 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 when you're reading the paper, you say, oh, this looks interesting. And I get to the end of the, of the section and say, well, actually, didn't find anything interesting. <laughs> so in that, in that sense, the, the paper is, is, it mimics real life and it's very frustrating. <laughs> and, and when you read published papers, they, they always take out the stuff they, that, they, that was boring. Um, so yes, that, that, that was kind of, I found that surprising. First of all, that there was such a sharp distinction. There is obviously just these two phases. And the fact that their estimation accuracy did not change. Well, tiddly amount, you know, nothing worth, nothing worth shouting about. Do you also consider what is the complexity of any given it would have been fantastic to have lines of code written because then you could have done, you know, the amount, because then you could say, well, look, they've, they've done more lines of code or deleted more lines of code, or, but no, that, 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 that data is not available. They, they sold the product so the data is not in the database. Okay, so going by the number of completed tasks, uh, in 2006, the number of completed tasks is way higher than yeah, yeah. in 2013. Yeah. So the, the number of completed tasks in or uh, <coughs> they were shorter, perhaps they had shorter tasks, but, but no, they didn't. You think, well, you can have more tasks if you, if you have shorter tasks. So rather than having one 10-hour task, you can have 10 one-hour tasks. That would make more tasks. But actually, no, no, that, that didn't occur. Didn't change. You, you, I, I kept looking at that thing, that there has to be a difference. And I couldn't find, I mean, there might be a difference, I just didn't find it. If you find a difference, please let me know. Because well, I think what this person mentioned about the story point estimation, so you basically give like a confidence interval to complete that task. And I did the same thing, but I did on story points. Basically, what happens on my data set is that around, well, we use Fibonacci, and like, I would say five points is like half day or a bit closer to eight, maybe seven hours. So when you estimate something that is around day and half, usually people are fine. So they would from one day to day and a half, or maybe. But if you estimate that you have no idea of something like a week, it even goes even further. So the key task, if you just see that something goes so big, you just have to jump in. Only after that, it falls into like confidence. Well, so the, the question with all of this, of course, is, is, is how like this is, uh, how are uh, the, well, hang on, let me. So, so, so what, what useful things have we learned? Stephen kept saying, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. Of course, he sold the company now, so <laughs> you can't actually get to apply it. So it's his data, and therefore he, he learned lots of stuff. Um, I learned, for me, what I learned was the uh, round numbers. I, that, that round number thing was kind of like, Phew. and there were lots of things I thought, patterns that I thought should be there that weren't there. So that was a bit, I, thought, I, I, I still think, well, perhaps if someone else's data, they'll be, there, they'll be there in someone else's data. I'm sure they exist. You know, it's like, it's like the hunt, hunt, hunt for the um, Loch Ness Monster. I'm sure it exists. So I just have to look in a different lock. Uh, it's there somewhere. So then, of course, you, I mean, what useful things could you learn from this? Well, you could learn that we could be, if you have data, you can build models. Um, and the models might be interesting to you. Uh, you, the, the fact that round numbers exist might be of interest to you, the general numbers might be interest to you. It's very difficult to say from just one data set to generalize to the rest of the world. How would you take this data and say, well, the rest of the world is going to look like this? 
perhaps round numbers don't generalize elsewhere. Perhaps they do. Who knows? So evidence-based software engineering has to be based on things that are useful for people, not just you know, fitting models and drawing equations. Um, so that was a question I kept asking. So the data sets out there. I think there are more patterns to be discovered. You, you've asked some questions. So um, uh, hopefully they'll have practical value. So if you find a, a pattern in there, please let me know. <laughs> so I can go and look, look somewhere else. The data's all there. Uh, hopefully people will, will and it's big. It's, it's, it, as I say, it's two orders of magnitude bigger than, than whatever uh, anyone else has released. And it's got more, more columns as well. So an offer. If you have some, I'm looking for, for more data. Uh, so I'm offering a free service. I will analyze your data. The catch is that you have to make the data public. Uh, I will anonymize it for you so that, you know, turn developer IDs into numbers and hide embarrassing numbers or uh, data or just delete stuff or, or whatever. So if you've, got, if you've got some data you're interested in having analyzed, get in touch. Uh, the condition is uh, it has to be made public. So write about my blog in my book and so on. So that's it. Thank you very much. From my understanding, it was quite greedy, so like you started from the variable that had the biggest effect, and then you especially. Yeah. How did you try to start out, and then how did you come up from special biases that you introduced on the way? Well, I start. That was that was the obvious one to start with because that's that's where everybody else starts. So I I started there. Um, and it, it has the biggest effect, you're right. And I, my, um, my, I wanted to, to, for Stephen to say, that's interesting. So I was going, huh, well, which one should I try, try next? But actually, in practice, to fit, fit this model takes like 10 seconds. Once you've loaded, the, I, I was using R, once you've loaded it all up, you have to type a variable name in and you run it, and it's, you know, okay, I, perhaps, perhaps 20 seconds. It's so easy to do, you just throw them all in there. Um, so, the, although the data is big, it, it, it computationally wasn't expensive. So, so this model here, you, you spend more time thinking about it and trying out ideas. Or we put this variable here, like for instance, that square root. Where did that square root come from? That was just me playing around. Oh, team size. Hmm. Okay, probably not linear. Let's. Try, I tried log, and that didn't work very well. Okay, let's try square root. So it's really suck it and see. And square root kind of fitted very well. Then I looked at it, it was only 1% difference. So I've only put it, I put it there because I put so much effort into finding it, I put it on the screen. <laughs> really, at 1%, you shouldn't really put it up there. But, you know, I found it, I'm going to put it up on the, on the screen. There is a team size effect, a whole 1%. Um, but, but then most of the teams were one people, so perhaps you, you wouldn't expect to find a big team size effect. So it's all about coming up with ideas, like people saying, well, what about the delay between uh, estimating and, and, um, and starting it? You know, what effect would that have? And then you write the code and try them out. Uh, the, since this is the first data set with this, that contains this amount of information, it's really it's all unknown. Typ typically, yeah, typically you just get the estimate and the actual, and that's it. That's all you that's all you're told. So to have all this other information here. It's like, ooh, and then to have so many of them. <coughs> so, you've got the task, task well, it's, a, it's just a task ID. So every task has a number. No so, task, no description, no, no. Um, How can you tell when it was estimated? Because there's a date. The date gives you the date of estimate, the date of start, and the also and the date. There, there are multiple dates. Yes. Um, and in fact, the, 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 there is a breakdown by um, the, 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 the pipeline. There is a pipeline breakdown. But really, you're, you're only interested in start and finish. So the reason that this shrinks down, the, the reason this shrinks from there to there, is that the, uh, there were that many tasks that weren't completed. So they just got, got, got taken out. And so when you, when you say, well, I started something and I got to a certain stage in the pipeline, that's not really interesting. About, about 199 tasks got cancelled. They said, okay, we've got this far. We're just going to cancel. You know, we're not going to finish. 
and a variety of other things going on. But there's nothing you can really do with that information. Um, yeah. So I, I, I looked for time series. You, you can see the weekends in there. If you analyze, do a uh, cross-correlation analysis, you can see weekends in there. They didn't do any work. Sometimes they did work at weekends, but not very often. So you can see weekends in there. But there's, there's no real... I didn't see any uh, time series stuff in there. I was hoping there'd be some. You'd think there'd be a Friday effect or a Monday effect. You know, they, 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 they do more on Fridays or more on... But there, there wasn't. Or rather, I didn't find one. Perhaps, perhaps there is a, you know, a Friday effect or a Monday effect, but... Or you think they wouldn't start a task on... Um, a, a long task on the Friday because the weekend got in the way, but... You, just different ideas you try and it, it's not there. Well, they, 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 they worked for people like Lloyd's of London and, and stuff like So they had products for these people. And so it was a small group of people. Um, and, and, they, and off they went and they, they did their thing. Everyone was responsible for their own uh, tasks. Uh, and off they went. Could you please tell more about your book? What's the goal? Um, the book? Oh, yes. I can, I'm always happy to tell you about the book. You can, you can, get, you can download the PDF here. So the, the aim of the book is uh, to have all the publicly, I discuss all the publicly available software engineering data. Now that sounds uh, really grandiose until you realize there isn't much data out there. So the reason that one person is able to, to, to go out and collect all the publicly available software engineering data is there isn't much. And so <laughs> um, it's getting bigger slowly. So there's about 600 data sets. The, the, most of them are not this big. Most of them are much smaller than this. 600? About 600, yeah. It's probably about twice as many as I originally thought. I started in 2011, so I want to get it finished this year. Um, so all the, uh, I, all the data is there. I analyze the data. There's a, there's a half the book is on... Um, the slides are on GitHub, and I posted the, uh, to the meetup um, the discussion. There's the link to the, to the slides. So you, you can go and download the slides, and the links are all there. The, the second half of the book it, it, it is uh, Introduction to Statistical Analysis or Data Analysis for Software Developers. So it's supposed to tell you, you know, you're a software developer, here's some data, what do you do with it? How do you analyze it? So there's a whole load of couple hundred pages on that. Then the first half of the book is um, I go through software developers, economics, uh, ecosystems, software, proje software projects, and reliability and source code. So I talk, talk about chunks of, of stuff. Oh, download it and have a look. But I want your data. Send me, you, said you, you, have, you said you had some data? Send me your data. Or well, tell your friends about it. I'll have to stop you so things okay. can wrap up. Okay. The room is still late. Okay. Uh, feel free to stay around if you want to make more questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.